Thank you. I'm Stephen Hood. I'm co-founder of Blockboard. This is a community bulletin board. You've all seen them before. They're in the backs of coffee shops and libraries. They exist because people have a real need to talk to their neighbors. Um, but it's hard to talk to your neighbors sometimes. In fact, sometimes it's actually awkward to talk to your neighbors, right? Um, I mean, we don't really want to be friends with our neighbors, but it's important to have a connection, right? What we need is a way to have that connection without making it weird. So that's where Blockboard comes in. It's a mobile bulletin board for your neighborhood. So what we do is use GPS to connect you to people who live nearby so you can get help from your neighbors without having to bake them cookies. So if it's about your neighborhood, you can find it or post it on Blockboard. I'll give you an example. Let's say you've lost your cat. So you could spend days going around the neighborhood. That's my cat, by the way. Um, you could spend days going around trying to put up posters, or you could post on Blockboard in a few seconds. Your neighbors can follow up with you directly. Another uh, case might be there's been a bunch of break-ins on your block. So what you can do is you can post on Blockboard and create a mobile neighborhood watch. Let's say that uh, there's a pothole outside your house and it's driving you nuts. The city won't do anything about it. You can post it on Blockboard. We will actually send it to the city automatically and we will follow up on the fix and let you know about it. So these are just a few examples of what you can do with Blockboard. So who are we? So we actually have a, a great team I'm really proud of. Um, we have people who come from senior roles at uh, Craigslist, which is unusual, at Delicious, uh, Technorati, and uh, my co-founder Dave over here comes from Stanford's design school, the D School. We also have a great group of investors we're very lucky to have. Uh, we raised around last year uh, when we were called Block Chalk, and we built a prototype back then that uh, attracted a lot of attention, a lot of users. So we've been working on this problem for a while. We think we're onto something. Uh, we also do have a, uh, a revenue model. It's built in. It's an extension of the product, uh, but we're waiting to And you're going to have to tell later. us about your revenue model during the Q&A. All right. Thank thanks. You. Which I'm sure is going to be one of the judges' first questions. I can't imagine. Can't questions. Imagine. Yeah. So together. what's your revenue what's your model? Revenue model? <laughs> More surprise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I did want to. I did want to um, ask. Like, would you integrate something like neighbor goods into what you're doing? Absolutely. I mean, I think that what we're building is a platform as much as a social network, right? We're trying to create ways for neighbors to re-engage, right. right, with their neighborhoods and with each other. So. Things that are a natural thing that you want to talk to your neighbors about yeah. uh, are a great place to put it. Yeah. And how do you t how do you scale the telling the city council members about the potholes? Because I know there was a uh, I can't remember the name of Open Three One One. No, it was in the UK. It was like sorry, fix my street. Thank you. There's, uh, yeah, there's several apps that are exploring this problem. There's actually an open standard called Open Three One One. Uh, San Francisco, D.C., other cities are kind of starting to adopt it. Um, so in San Francisco, where we're, we're doing our launch originally, um, we are integrated with Open 311 directly. So we actually, it's an API to the city. We can send them your report of the pothole, the photo, where it is on the map, your comment, and then we can get a report back from them on the status, which we can send to you. Very, so, very cool, yeah. very cool. So what is the revenue model? So the revenue model is, um, I think if you look at something like Craigslist as an example, you know, people are willing to pay for access to a very local community, especially if they're part of that community. And so I think we're looking at something down the road where certain classes of, of posts and interactions would be monetized, and many would not be. Um, but we think that's a, a very powerful model that's been proven uh, already. Is this just a mobile app, or is there a web part of it, too? We're, we're mobile first. We feel it's pretty important to start with the mobile platform. We think that's where the opportunity is. Uh, we think that, you know, what we're trying to do is reach people, right? And people are going to be increasingly using this to connect and to do computing activities in their neighborhoods when they're out and about on the street and they see that problem, right? Where they see evidence of a crime. So we're starting with mobile. Uh, web will be a part of it at some point, I'm sure. And so what, what's, the, what's the marketing strategy to actually build the community and get it together and to right. identify the audience? Well, one of the, we did a lot of experimentation um, with block chalk before, and one of the things we learned is you have to start very local, like hyper locally, almost ultra locally, to coin a new phrase. Maybe, probably not. Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're starting in specific neighborhoods of San Francisco, and we're going to build out from there. So it's a combination of social networking because there is intersection between social networks and neighborhood networks, 
you also know people who live in your neighborhood or within the same city. Um, we're also looking at uh, experimenting with a variety of, of other sort of paid and unpaid acquisition strategies. So from partnerships and integration with local blogs and newspapers uh, to uh, you know, doing promotions or sponsorships of local organizations to get the word out on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Our hope is once we get the first few cities lit up, we'll start to get some brand recognition and those uh, efforts will be more scalable and repeatable. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on the lack of modernization, though, does it? Because that's hand-to-hand -hand combat for a while. I'm sorry? It's hand-to-hand -hand combat for a while, so it puts a lot of pressure on, on bringing monetization near. Right, that's true. I mean, we, it, it's a delicate balance. We don't want to activate the monetization too early, because we think once you put money into the user motivations, you kind of inherently change it in a way. Like, it's if you put um, AdSense on your blog. You're kind of telling your readers something about why you're writing. Right? Like, it's not a bad thing, it's just, it's there, right? And so we don't want to do that too early because we don't want to change the character of the community. Other people have tried to do uh, sort of local classified systems and local bulletin boards, and they've gone straight for the buy-sell type stuff, and there's no liquidity. There's no one in the marketplace yet. So we're focused on building that community first. And look, Twitter's been around since 2006. It still doesn't have a revenue model. It's doing just fine, right? <laughs> So how much density do you have to get in a market to make it interesting where you can turn on monetization? That's one of the things we're learning now, frankly. I mean, it's, it kind of depends on the neighborhood. You know, and the sizes of neighborhoods and their density are different in different cities. So in San Francisco and New York, you have a lot of very small, tightly packed neighborhoods. Uh, in a city like Columbus, Ohio, you have less and they're broader. So I think it will depend on the geography. Um, but it's some level of self-sustaining activity in the product. People logging in, posting and contributing. Uh, that we will, we will have to measure over time. So I'm always kind of concerned about um, creating more packets and silos of data. And I think this is really beautiful data, personally. Like, this is the stuff that I think shows the character of a place and time and people within it. Um, Thanks. Have you thought about... You're welcome. Um, <laughs> And I think these things are really important, whether they're monetizable or not. I mean, that's, that's, we need to figure that out. But, uh, you know, have you thought about data portability, where else you can put it, where? Absolutely, our intention is to have an open API for this product so people can get to the data. And eventually, uh, people could build clients to contribute data as well. Um, I mean, we're building an open community here, so it has to be accessible. Uh, people have to be able to get to their data if they want. Um, I and mean, that includes non-digital things, too. Like, you might want to print out your post. Uh, in the screenshots, I don't know if you could tell, but they look like flyers for a reason, right? You might want to print that out and put that on a light post you know, once in a while. You never know. So you might want to email it or share it with you. You know that I can print from my Android-based device, right? Is that the Zoom or...? Nice. No, I'm not advertising it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so have you heard of the Locker project at all? I don't think I have. Yeah, I just met them the other day. You might want to talk to them about the data store, personal data store. Cool. So why, not, why not integrate with Facebook? And, and why aren't people just doing this on Facebook? Yeah, why not Facebook group? Well, it's an interesting question. So first, we are going to integrate with Facebook. We'll definitely allow that. But we believe that, um, that your neighbors are very different than your friends and from your colleagues. Right? Your Facebook and your LinkedIn are not your block board. Um, we're, we're trying to tap into something different. We think your neighborhood is a latent social network, right? one that's asleep in, for most of us. I mean, how many people here know the names of the people who live on either side of them back home? Raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe a quarter, maybe. And we see that everywhere we talk about this. More people have clicked on a, a Facebook ad than that almost. I'm sorry? The, more people have clicked on a Facebook ad, we learned yes. earlier almost. Yeah, so we, we think that their connectivity does exist. That connectivity does exist, and where it does, Facebook is a great way to help us harness that. But fundamentally, what we, if we're successful, we'll reach a bunch of people who aren't connected today at all. And there'll be great value in activating those connections. Because they share space, they share issues, they share concerns because of where they live. I, just, I, just, I guess I don't understand why you wouldn't put it on the web, on Facebook, you said on Android, sooner rather than later, because you're, you're just, the density problem, just being on an iPhone is tough. Because how many people know how many of their neighbors have an iPhone? I would guess it's, you, you just lose half the audience right there. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge number of iPhones in the city where we're starting, um, in San Francisco specifically. There's a reason for that. They're we're going to be on, 
Yeah, a huge, huge number. Um, it's outrageous, in fact, how many there are. Um, we're going to be on Android very soon, absolutely. We're a four-man team, so we started uh, with, the, with the product where we felt we could best define an excellent user experience, which we think is key to making this attractive. So um, Android is, you know, is right up next, absolutely. Well, and I would think with uh, the mobile experience, and what I'm finding more and more um, is that I'm always, I'm always on, on the run, and the better an app works on the fly, like reporting a pothole or whatever else, the, the, more, like, the more likely I am to use it. I don't right. go back home and sit down at my computer and type in, yeah. I just found a exactly. pothole at... You want to capture that experience at the moment that it happens, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. do you, I mean, you also don't want 10 apps to do these things, I think. Like, we think that there's a natural opportunity to simplify and roll it up into one thing, which is the app for your neighborhood. So, so I get the idea of focus. I guess the thing that I would worry about is that you're, you're reducing the demographic you're going to go after. So maybe to pile on what Tom was saying, um, it's an age skew, an income skew that you end up hitting. Um, and if you think about neighbors who are more likely to find that cat um, maybe care about being more neighborly. Um, I wonder if maybe that's the extra set. That's a really good point. I mean, I think that people are more likely to have a smartphone than a computer increasingly. So um, even across a variety of income brackets, people are spending for that. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is I think we need to think about things like SMS integration, uh, feature phone integration. That, give, that would give us a lot of, uh, of reach as well. Um, but it's something we're definitely aware of. Sorry. Lost cat SMS. X and X. Response to Fluffy. <laughs> how local is this? How local is this block board? So is it like ten blocks in San Francisco, or all of San Francisco? Or? So it, it's biased by proximity to where you are, um, but the sizes of the neighborhoods actually reflect sort of the social boundaries, and we've we've based it on a combination of our own data and uh, data from sources like Flickr, which are crowdsourced neighborhood boundaries based on how people tag photos and uh, the coordinates they upload. So we actually have these very organic shapes for most major cities of the world. So um, how many blocks are there, or how many communities are there in San Francisco, as an example? Um, there's about 100, actually, overall. We may not go that deep in detail for a while. We may kind of break them down over All right. time. Yeah. We're out of time. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you very much. And, uh,